And today's question is going, going to be, can artificial intelligence help us find alien worlds? Um, so that's our question for today. And we're going to see various aspects of it. Just before we get started, um, a few words on uh, who I am. And in case that was not obvious yet for my accent, I grew up in France, where I graduated with the master um, from Main Saint Etienne Engineering School, specializing in data science and big data. Then um, I moved on um, with a master of in astrophysics and cosmology at the University of Barcelona. And then I finally landed in London, where I have been able to mix these two disciplines together in a PhD combining exoplanet sciences and machine learning in the Exo AI group, led by my supervisor, Ingo Waldman. Um, and I'm still based at the moment there at UCL. Okay, uh, but in addition to this, I also uh, do some science outreach um, a project. I'm involved here uh, at the Real Observatory, Observatory Greenwich, but also through the Orbit Science Education Program uh, through UCL, and also with the Exoclock Citizen Science Project. Um, so I'm also interested in how to communicate science, not only doing research. Okay, um, and this is our very simple outline for today. First, we're going to um, introduce exoplanets and very broadly where we are in terms of um, exoplanets discoveries today. Um, and then we'll continue by discussing more specifically the use of AI for exoplanets. We'll see what deep learning and AI or artificial intelligence are. Um, and then we'll mention, mention a few successful app, uh, applications or examples of AI techniques used today for exoplanet studies. Um, so hopefully we should get out of this lecture with some uh, keys of understanding, but how is AI used today for exoplanet sciences? Um, and by the way, this image here was generated using uh, the popular dal e 2 um, artificial intelligence with a caption, uh, a population of exoplanets discovered with artificial intelligence. Um, it's quite mystic to me what this represents, and, but hey, uh, that's an interesting image. Okay, um, so exoplanets are um, nothing else than just planets orbiting other stars. Um, so it's a very simple definition, although yes, this does suppose that we agree on what a planet is. Um, but amazingly, we all have an intuitive understanding of what planets are. Um, and this should be enough for the sake of today's lecture. Um, so since planets will be stars, we talk of planetary systems to refer to a star along with the planetary objects orbiting this star. The solar system is by far the planetary system we know the best and arguably the most important as well uh, because we happen to be living in the solar system. Um, it has got eight planets, five dwarf planets, more than 200 moons, asteroids and comets and, and there are still things that we are dis discovering in the planets in the solar system and we are far from having finished to explore it and we're still discovering new objects but also learning more about those um, and for a long time this was the only planetary system that we knew um, and and it's only recently that we have discovered other planetary systems uh, and indeed it's in 1995 that the first friendly exoplanet was discovered so i say friendly because it orbits a star like our sun um, it, and so not a fast rotating, highly magnetized pulsating star as was found a few years previously. Um, and so the two main scientists behind this discovery of uh, this exoplanet 51 Peg B where Michel Mayor and Didier Kellos were awarded with the Nobel Prize in 2019, Nobel Prize in Physics. So really this must be something important in the scientific world. And in fact, this marked uh, the, what is considered as the true beginning of exoplanet sciences a bit less than 30 years ago. So we're talking of a recent field in astronomy compared to plenty of other um, subfields in astronomy. So this was the first detection, but what's in then? How many planets do we know at the moment? Well, we now know more than 5,000 
problem exoplanets. What we're seeing right now um, is the evolution of the number of exoplanets that we know uh, and that we have known since uh, the 90s, since the first detections. And this might just be the very beginning because in fact, uh, we know that now planets are a very common thing. So it's very easy for stars to form planets. And in average, we expect that there are at least one planet per star. And so if we account for 400 billion stars in Milky Way and a few uh, 100 billion galaxies in the universe, then we may have something like 10 to the power of 22 planets in the entirety of the observable universe. So really we've only just started to scratch the surface of planets observation and exoplanets observations around us. So it's really exciting. It's a very new field and we know that there's planets everywhere so we're just starting to learn about them. Um, so when, where do we care about this, these worlds? They're, they're far too far away to even think of going to travel to the nearest exoplanet. Um, no, you know, most of them, we can't even see them directly. They're just too far away. Well, by studying them, we can still um, try and getting closer to answering questions such as what is the population of exoplanets like? What are the different types of planets? How do planets form and evolve? What are they made of? What are the conditions or possible markers for life? And this in turn is shedding light on our own solar system, our planet Earth and the very phenomenon of life on Earth, which again is the only occurrence of this phenomenon that we know of at the moment. Um, so looking at the more general distribution and population of exoplanets really help us to understand what planets are in general and does understand better our solar system. Um, along with life here on Earth. Um, to do this, there are various observatories both on the ground, but also in space. Uh, here is an overview of the main space missions, um, which either have been used for exoplanets without having been designed for exoplanets, such as Hubble or Spitzer. Um, the two you know, first missions, uh, which were very useful for characterizing exoplanets to look at what their, their atmospheric compositions was. Um, Hubble is still in use. But then later on, there have been several uh, missions designed for exoplanets, either specifically to, on, on, the, on the top, these missions were mostly uh, dedicated to the, to the study of exoplanets uh, or just some part of, of their objective, the bottom with uh, Gaia and, and James Webb. So uh, now we're learning more and more because we have more and more data about exoplanets and whether they're looking at them in you know, different methods and different parts of, of the electromagnetic spectrum, different lights. Uh, we are definitely learning more and we are going to learn even more about these exoplanets, not only detecting them, but also learning more about the ones we know. And in 2029, this is when um, the launch of Ariel on the top right here is uh, planned. And this mission will really um, <clears throat> multiply the number of characterized planets, the planets for which we will know uh, the atmosphere of. And so that's really going to help us to build populations of really well characterized exoplanets. So we're going to go much further than just knowing there are planets over there, but also what their composition um, may have. In here is an artist representation of uh, some of the planets we know today. So no real pictures but some of you know, some ideas of what they may look like. Uh, and so there's plenty of strange new worlds in these planets we already know, and they may look quite different from anything you'd find in the solar system. For example, some orbit very close to their stars in less than one day. Um, and we find planets of all sizes, all temperatures. And in terms of composition, there are even some quite surprising types such as ocean planets, are thought to be covered with liquid water. Um, lava planets, so hot that they are thought to be covered with melted rock or diamond planets and 
probably even more that we can't even imagine. You know? So reality is stranger than fiction sometimes. And we definitely find some things which are seem very alien compared to the solar system itself. Um, and so it, you know, it helps us to put in perspective whether the Earth and the solar system is indeed a typical planetary system or on the contrary, it would be a very strange one. It does seem to lean a little bit more towards the second option at the moment that there are fewer of these of, of these configurations as the solar system out there. Okay, so now as we were saying before, we're getting into an era of exoplanet characterization. That's really exciting because with Ariel, we will be able to observe um, about 1,000 planets across the whole sky, as shown on the left plot here. Um, and for each planet, missions such as the Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb, or Ariel, Ariel um, are measuring the absorption of molecules as a function of the wavelengths on, on the horizontal axis there. Um, and the fact that here this spectrum is not flat indicates the presence of an atmosphere on this simulated planet. And the various bumps can be linked to molecules in the atmosphere absorbing light differently at different specific wavelengths. And so if we run some atmospheric models, we can infer what is the composition of the atmosphere at this wavelength. And when we look at the different colors, whereas Hubble Space Telescope is only sensitive to this green part of the spectrum, James Webb um, in red, and later um, Ariel in, in yellow will be sensitive to much larger part of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum to more frequencies enabling far more precise characterization of the atmospheres uh, they will be looking at. Um, but when we're looking at planets, we need to keep in mind that they are very small compared to their host stars most of the time. And in addition to this, stars are variable and instruments are not perfect. So all of these generates noise or even time, vari time variable noise. And this needs to be disentangled from the planet contribution. So really, especially if we're talking of rocky planets, the small Earth-like planets are even smaller. They can be very, very small compared to our sun, for example, in here, as we can see. On, on these two plots there. Um, and the, the stars may be rotating, they can have flares and, and spots and various things around them They can be active and all of these uh, can make the detection and the study of planets harder. So really it's a hard uh, data analysis problem than detecting and, and characterizing exoplanets. It's really like looking for needles in a high stack of noise. Now, um, can you find the planet on this picture? There is one planet hidden on this picture. I'm going to leave you a few seconds. You need to have a clean screen for that. You need to remove all the little pieces of dust grains on your screen. Um, but this one is not a dust grain. This is Mercury in the most planet in the solar system um, as it was transiting across the sun. So we are used to solar eclipses on Earth when the moon is covering the totality of the sun's surface. Uh, but that's a little bit of a special case because we are, we are much closer to the moon than we are from the sun. And this is why such a small body as the moon can cover the entirety of, of the sun's uh, surface. And with Mercury, as it is much further away, you know, better ratio, the better idea of how much smaller Mercury is compared to the Sun. Um, now, if we're looking at Mercury passing in front of the Sun, you can superimpose the different pictures, and it really looks like we've got a cord here um, drawn by Mercury passing in front of the Sun as it was orbiting around, around the Sun. So in the case of the inner solar system planets like Mercury and Venus, we can see them passing in front of the sun simply by taking pictures. In fact, Kepler predicted the occurrence of these transits, which were uh, later observed. Um, but the same principle can be applied to exoplanets, in that if we are lucky enough to be 
um, well aligned on Earth with the orbital plane of a nearby planetary system, then in principle, we should be able to witness the transit of these exoplanets. However, as stars are far too far away to be resolved, to be seen directly, uh, then needless to say that exoplanets can't be seen um, as well. While these tiny dots orbiting over the star, then we can't really see these pictures. And instead, what astronomers do is that they use telescopes to measure precisely, precisely the light emitted by a star, trying to look for decreases of light due to the planets passing in front of their stars, typically for a few hours. And so they, they're looking at these transits, but in photometry, looking at the light emitted from the star, uh, which will decrease during a transit instead of using these pictures. Um, and doing this, most of, well, a majority of the planets that we know have been discovered using this transit technique. And this is why I'm, I'm mentioning it right now. This is one of the most important techniques uh, today to detect and study exoplanets. And so when these planets are passing in front of the star, we can see these light curves as drawn on this little video in here. Uh, light curves meaning simply the brightness as a function of time, the brightness of the star. Um, and this technique is also useful to study atmospheres because if we are looking at these variations as a function of the frequency and in different lights, we might be able to see some variations due to the various apparent radii of the planet, which absorbs more or less at different frequencies, different scale heights. This is the same principle for atmospheres as well. Okay, um, light curves are also used for to study stars in general, variable stars, but also other bodies, and they can be very noisy objects. And, and here, exoplanets, for example, on the right, we have one exoplanet, one clear exoplanet, and one light curve. Um, they can be used for other things, and, and really, we want to remove the noise as well as possible uh, and, and disentangle the different components in a light curve. So it's a really interesting problem. Uh, and the intuition is that if we have plenty of those light curves um, and a lot of this data, then we can try and, and process it automatically. So now let's switch gear and start talking a little bit about artificial intelligence, um, this very broad term to designate algorithms, mimicking some aspects of human intelligence. Um, at the moment, all the design AI algorithms have only been able to carry out some specific tasks. However, they have already produced some impressive results and are already used in science. Here are just a few examples of AI breakthrough um, in different fields uh, with different sorts of data on images and videos. We have uh, languages and you know, language processing, games, time series, and audio signals, and even physics as well. Um, and so it's really spreading in different different fields. Um, but yeah, it's also good to keep in mind that um, what we hear about in the media is just the tip of the iceberg, and the research and ideas in artificial intelligence are still developing very fast and so we expect to have much more of the systems being developed in the next few years uh, and and possibly even to to spread in various aspects of our life too so one of the most ingredient a uh, most important ingredient uh, of current ai systems is the use of artificial neural networks so let's take a look at what these are um, because most of the very successful applications that we hear of at the moment in artificial intelligence involve um, artificial neural networks, which are inspired from, um, from the brain uh, very broadly. But these models combine lots of units that we can call neurons because they're inspired from the brain neurons. And if a neuron is a very simple unit acting like a door, letting more or less of an input, um, passing to the next layers. And by combining many neurons in a now large network, we can build very complex functions, even though each individual unit is very simple. So the final piece we need is to adapt these weights all together to optimize our network by feeding the model with data and giving it an objective to learn. 
So this is a very general framework with very powerful, expressive, flexible functions that, that are this family of models called artificial neural networks. Um, these models are very data greedy. Um, and whereas we as humans can learn from just a few examples only, these models require many examples to perform well. And the larger the data set, the better our model will be. We typically, at least a few thousands, preferably millions of examples um, that may be needed. So the good thing being in astronomy and exoplanet sciences, we have a lot of data and even more coming with the new telescopes on the ground and in space. These are just some of the light curves acquired by the TESS mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, uh, which is monitoring millions of stars across the whole sky to look for transit signals. And if we just pick a few of these light curves, then they may appear totally different. But if we grade the data set, allowing even more light curves to come into it, then we'll start to see patterns and there will be more and more similarities and correlations between these different light curves. And a model, an AI model, will be able to make connections between the various examples and learn from the diversity. Um, Um, and because indeed in physics, we care not only about results, but also about how we produce these results. And it's important to be able to justify um, why a certain result is, is claimed or produced by a certain model. So there is more than just performance. Um, we would like our models to be explainable, to be able to explain them and ideally produce uncertainty and, and errors associated mm -hmm did with our predictions as well. So it's really important to have these reflections in mind when we're trying to use artificial intelligence for, um, for physics and astronomy as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna check if this, mm -hmm. there's the questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, it looks like we're okay for now. Please do interrupt if there is any anything that I should be aware of during uh, during the lecture. Otherwise, I'll just continue. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just thought uh, I would ask the question, the original question, can artificial intelligence help us find alien worlds to a chatbot, to an artificial intelligence processing language models and see what it thinks? Um, so here's the answer from uh, chat GPT um, this month. Yes, artificial intelligence AI can help us find alien worlds. AI can be used to analyze large amounts of data, such as images of stars and galaxies to identify patterns that may indicate the presence of exoplanets. So already we can see that the, the AI here, chat GPT has managed to make the links between alien worlds and exoplanets. That's also implicitly what I've been assuming for these talks. You know? I've, I've talked mostly of exoplanets without even mentioning alien worlds. Um, and so that's quite interesting. It made, it made the same link and also the link between exoplanets and stars and galaxies. And the fact that we need a lot of data uh, to give an artificial intelligence to produce results. So it's quite interesting. It's, it's fairly broad um, and we're far from having any very innovative idea from this, but it makes sense. Uh, and so I thought that would be uh, interesting to just have a look at. But now let's have a look at um, how is artificial intelligence actually used today in exoplanet sciences? Let's get to the point um, because it has already pervaded nearly all aspects of data analysis in in um, exoplanet sciences already. There's plenty of different techniques which already use artificial intelligence um, 
And so it's far from completely replacing it, but it's still, it's already being used in various aspects. And now we are going to discuss some of these applications. I might miss many of them, uh, but this will hopefully give a little bit of a taster and an idea of how is AI already used in exoplanet sciences. Uh, so, one of the main ways neural networks are used today is to, to help discovering planets in transit-like curves. So really using these techniques uh, we've seen before, because typically the way transit detections are done is um, that in large transit surveys, we have millions of light curves, such as um, the ones seen by Kepler and TESS missions, and in the, those millions of light years, we need to identify the planetary signals. And there are plenty of candidates which are found um, in the first step. And in these candidates, we can have planets, but we can also have binary stars and we can have some noise. And so it's important to be able to see which of these signals actually are planets. Um, and typically this classification used to be done uh, by hand, manually, by, by humans, would take a long time to classify and manually la label each candidate. Uh, but with the, the, the many like that we have at the moment, this can't really be continued manually for a long time, or this would require many people to do it. And instead, um, there has been some work to use neural networks to replace this, these humans in the vetting process in the detection pipeline and to classify which signals could be due to planets and which signals aren't linked to actual planets. And these works have led to new planets being detected, such as famously this additional rocky planet in Kepler-90 uh, system, the eight planets. I think that's uh, the only other system that we know of with eight planets. Um, and it's help to save a lot of time on discarding obviously wrong detections to focus on the most, most interesting candidates and it's freed a lot of time uh, for humans to do more interesting jobs. Um, and there's been several articles following on from the first ones and which are, have been improving uh, these original neural networks and artificial intelligences uh, by adding more data or, or adapting the models further to make uh, this work very well and it's really helping in automating this long and tedious process um, okay that's one of the main applications but let's continue there's one still in transit observations um, this is linked to uh, some of my interests in and i think there's a lot of potential yet to explore in here in that um, one of the main difficulties in studying a transit and planets in general is to disentangle the different components from the star and uh, the instrument. And here, what we can see is six different transits of uh, the famous Hot Jupiter HD 18933B, uh, as seen by the Spitzer Space Telescope. And on the top, though, there is also a lot of variability that we can see uh, due to the instrument itself, which is not perfect. Um, and um, what we can also see in red is predictions of what an AI think the contribution from the instrument itself and the, and the star would be. What would be the flux if there was no transit from the planet at all? And so if we have an accurate prediction of this, what would be the flux without uh, any noise, then we can just remove this contribution from the star or from the instrument and end up with only a clean signal from the planet um, on the bottom. So that's um, that's one example, but there has been other uh, such examples of art artificial intelligence being used to model the noise and really learn as well as possible the behavior from the instrument um, in order to model more accurately the transit signals or other planetary signals as well. Um, coming back to the detection of planets, uh, there are a few planets which have been found directly using directly uh, um, direct imaging, which is directly looking at images. Uh, and this is challenging because 
using these uh, these sort of images, there is a lot of noise as well, as we can see in the patterns um, there, which are diffraction patterns. So these are real images uh, from Hubble, uh, looking at diff uh, three different um, planetary systems, and we can see bright patterns because of this diffraction. And here, a neural network was trained to classify images with planets and some without planets on a large data set. Um, and the neural network was used to produce more of these images, to produce similar images, to augment the data set, and then to classify which images have planets from the ones which don't have planets. So again, classification to help planet detection um, in directly imaged um, techniques. And, and so not only these models can identify uh, which images have planets and which don't, but they can also identify the location of these planets uh, using some, some maps that they construct um, and which show which parts of the images were more important for the classification. So here again, we see an ability um, of neural networks to deal with complex noisy data and this trick that we can use to augment our data set to make it larger by simulating more of these images, whether it's classically or using artificial intelligence to, um, to simulate more of these images as well. Um, still looking at sort of images, but this time these aren't real images, they're constructed data um, for planet fighting and in those sort of river diagrams, which is showing when a transit occur. And if there's only one planet, we would expect the planets to be, um, planet orbit to, vary, to be periodic. And so the planet would come back at exactly at the same time at each period. Um, but if there are several planets, then it could be that these other planets are disturbing the orbit of a given planet. And then we would end up in those river diagrams and seeing this sort of wavy river um, path in there on these sort of diagrams. And this exploration and fitting of river diagrams with classical methods uh, can be a very long process. So using neural networks to do this job can help explore much faster, uh, more configurations and therefore help to, to detect new planets. Um, so, that's really helpful for these sort of timing variations searches, which is also linked to the to the transits, um, but it can be very long to process with classic methods. Okay, one of the very exciting areas in which AI is used as, at the moment is to model atmospheres. So really, there's a question whether AI can reliably spot molecules on exoplanets and the answer is basically yes um, so here again physical modeling of the atmospheres can take a very long time to compute you know, atmospheres are very complex um, uh, uh, um, things to model and so having an ai system doing the same might it might enable to probe even more models or um, more complex ones you know, we could have um, circulation models of actually you know weather patterns on the atmospheres when we have the data to back this up and so there has been already several promising results in terms of atmos atmospheric models but it is still hard because of the limited availability of the data we don't have that many spectra uh, observed at the moment um, a few tens maybe of planets which have been observed um, compared to the thousands of planets we know and, but this will change with the new missions uh, and the, as more data is coming in. And also we can use simulations to produce more of this data. And eventually, um, it would, would like to find um, maybe a system which would be able to deal with various instruments and types of noise as well. So there are still some challenges, uh, but there's strong hunch and strong hints that this will be possible and helped in, in some, some some part of the modeling of the atmospheres. Um, and there's also some 
interesting ways of finding new physics because if we're making our inference faster um, with neural networks where it used to be very long for some models um, then we can explore far more configurations and this is the case where it actually allowed to find some new physics um, this example is drawn from the micro lensing technique which is yet another type of a detection technique for exoplanets um, which which uses um, some general relativity um, um, theory and um, but there are still some questions um, in, in those techniques uh, when we look at, at, at this and so th in this um, research paper um, not only did, did they classify uh, events but they also simulated a large number of these micro lensing events when a planet um, <coughs> is passing along with a star just in front of a background very far away source to look at the magnification of, of the light from this background source. Um, and so they, they have been able to analyze the results in a probabilistic way um, using physics models which are very you know, competently prohibitive. Therefore, they used AI instead to make the inference much faster. And therefore, they, find, they found new examples of degeneracy, degeneracy hinting at a wider unifying theory of microlensing events. Um, so this really helped put the finger on where the current theory was, um, was lacking some unif unification. So this is huge here, because we are not just talking of automating, uh, but we're getting this, you know, AI models to a point in which they're really helpful to find some new physics. Um, so that's just one of these uh, recent examples of this, but we hope to find more new of those. It wouldn't be surprising that you no know, AI is playing a more important role in in those um, in those discoveries of new physics later on. Um, and that that's another uh, sort of line of search that we've explored at, um, in UCL in which we're trying to combine some physics models, in this case a transit model, along with a neural network and build hybrid models in which you know, the neural network could be placed just before a transit model or in parallel or just afterwards. And, and the fact that we're, you know, if we're building physics models which can be combined you know, in, in the same framework, then we can really take the best of both worlds um, and this can improve and guide AI models during the learning to pr produce more physical results, for example, or model some of the unknown parts of the data with neural networks while still modeling what we know well. Uh, so really, this is one of, of I, th I think, the promising ways of, of research for, for astronomy and, and maybe science in general, there are various ideas, drawing of this idea of trying to combine um, AI and physics system. And so, yeah, that's, that's for the, you know, the hybrid combina combination. And, and so that you know, would be, wouldn't be surprising to see more of these collaborations between uh, physics and AI, humans and machines, in the future, and that's a, another use of, of the DALI E2 um, uh, algorithm here to generate this image, um, in which I put something like, like this in, towards the collaboration between physics and AI, I believe, are the prompt to generate this image. Uh, but in, in one way or another, you know, AIs can be useful to at least support researchers in their research by automating some of the tasks or replacing them in some some others, um, and really helpful to scan very large data sets as well that we couldn't be uh, looking at otherwise. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's just the beginning, in fact, of you know exoplanet sciences and artificial intelligence. Um, we've only scratched the surface of solar system planets and started to look at the atmosphere of a few nearby exoplanets. So this respect is only the beginning. And there's still a lot to discover and learn about them. 
and in a way on another AI will support in this exploration. Um, but AI is already used to support discoveries and characterization of exoplanets you know, using most of the different techniques we're already using. Um, and with more data coming in, these techniques will be improving and astronomers will get more familiar with those techniques as well, trying to find the uh, best ways to combine the physics knowledge and expertise um, they have with, with the AI systems as well. And soon we'll uh, know uh, hundreds of thousands of planets and we'll learn much more about the diversity and the formation mechanisms. Um, probably we will detect more of, uh, of the small planets, exorings and exomoons and we'll identify biomarkers um, or hopefully we'll identify some biomarkers in the atmosphere. So really stay tuned because you know, this, this is going to get even more exciting.